Oh. Yeah. Um, great that you guys are still uh, sitting strong um, <laughs> at the end of this day. I mean, this is the last session uh, for this room anyway. Um, so this session is pretty much open-ended. The, the, the time slot that was reserved is more to allow the discussion to take place. Uh, it's not necessarily going to take one and a half hours, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah. uh, the purpose of this session is to elaborate a little bit further on the immersion standards, which I presented this morning in a, in a pretty high-level view. Um, what I'm going to do now is get a little bit deeper into uh, into all the topics that I mentioned that I covered this morning. So, um, is there anyone here that was actually in the presentation this morning? <laughs> all right, cool. So, uh, no, it's a little, it goes a bit deeper into the matter. Uh, more elaborate. It's, it's the same structure, uh, same topics, but now this time with some, actu with the actual fi with some actual figures, um, uh, with the actual metrics as well. Yeah, so it contains some more explanation and elaboration on, and also the relevance. So this is not going to be a monologue, at least not if it's up to me. Yeah, I'm Dutch, and one of the things that defines Dutch people is that we like to be direct and we love being interrupted. Now, that doesn't go for every Dutch person, but at least it goes that way with me. So while we're going through this, please do feel free to interrupt me and ask your questions. Um, for the sake of the recording, uh, there's two microphones on the stands. Uh, feel free to take them off and hand over some microphones so whatever your question is, it's going to be recorded as well. That uh, makes it a little bit nicer. So this morning I presented uh, initially the, some differentiations between the different technologies, right? Um, single phase, dual phase, you guys can find it all over this exhibition. You, can, you guys can find it in all the specs, in all the papers. So single phase is divided into two types of liquids, both chemical in nature. So forget about everything that you may have heard about liquids. We're all chemical, right? That means that it has some consequences, which we'll get to later on. Uh, hydrocarbons, based on oil, fluorocarbons, maybe you can elaborate that a little bit further. I mean, uh, 3M is here in the room as well, so is, is there somebody from 3M who wants to, who can elaborate a bit further on, let me, let me get you the microphone. Yeah, great, right. cool, yeah. So instead of me explaining fluorocarbons, uh, a manufacturer of fluorocarbons is here as well, as you all know, 3M. Thanks. So this is Jimil here, and thanks, Rolf. So the other day, I was watching a series on Netflix, and the guy was telling me that don't argue with the Dan. That is mainly from Danish, Dutch people who invaded the Britain. Oh, by jokes apart, so fluorocarbons, basically, 3M is the premier manufacturer for fluorocarbons since years, decades. And we have normally two series. One is called Florinut, that is FC series, and second is Novik. And so the chemistry that we consider for all the fluids, basically both types of, all types of fluids are extremely inert in terms of material compatibility. So they don't react with, when I say react, so reactivity has a different function than the driver. So basically, they're extremely material, material compatible with any kind of material, I would say, which are being used right now in servers. And so I'll just raise my case right now over here rather than going All into right. the chemistry. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, it, wasn't, it also wasn't meant as a marketing pitch. Yeah? So <laughs> no, it's all right. Uh, so uh, these type of liquids need to be circulated. In order to cool anything, you need to circulate a medium past it, right? In one way or another. Uh, because the heat needs to be absorbed and rejected from whatever it, uh, it's cooling. So there's several ways of doing that, and it's very simple. Actually, there's a, as far as I know, there's only two ways of doing it. Either you pump it, or you allow, it, you allow natural convection to get rid of the liquid from wherever it needs to move from. Right. Uh, 
Lateral convection circulation is not only applied in two phase. Yeah, so two phase is a great example of natural convection because it evaporates. Yeah, so it's gravity doing its work and, uh, and physics doing its work. That can also be applied in single phase. Also with both types of liquids. Pumping is not prohibited to hydrocarbons. It's also used with fluorocarbons. And so there is no set, there's no immediate relation between one type of liquid and a cooling strategy or a circulation method. Um, there, uh, the dual phase is, by definition, as far as the industry stands today, at least, fluorocarbon-based. As far as I'm aware, at least, there is no hydrocarbon that applies evaporation as a strategy. Um, with the circulation methods, uh, with dual phase, it's usually evaporation. Yeah? So uh, of, that, that's, that's the main, that's the most efficient way of dealing with the natural convection circulation. Uh, and the properties of the solutions, the solution design, uh, with single phase, evaporation is something to avoid. Yeah, so that's usually controlled by temperatures, or it can be controlled in other means. Uh, with two-phase, evaporation happens by design. So you can imagine that the type of solution would, be, would look a bit different and would be designed with completely different topics in mind, yeah, like uh, sealing a system, as we saw WeWin present a solution. Uh, one of the, uh, the main focus, also with Alibaba, also WeWin, Common denominator, sealing. Yeah, the vapor loss is a main element. Uh, with hydrocarbons, you get completely different design parameters. Yeah, you're focusing on different aspects, the viscosity, the quality of the oil, um, the types of oil that you're using, uh, but also how to maintain systems because the oil doesn't evaporate off the, the IT equipment, yeah, as fluorocarbons do. Now this comes to an, a next level in solution designs. So enclosed chassis, that's one of the topics. Uh, that means that a piece of IT is encapsulated inside a chassis, which is completely sealed off. Uh, um, Nigel is here, he's from Isotope. Isotope uses a completely sealed chassis. Uh, so but is there, are there specific challenges you would like to share in this context that makes it unique or? Thanks, Ralph. I, there are always challenges to try and make sure you're dealing with the vapor losses, um, you're dealing with pressure, you've got to deal with sealing uh, of the fluid, you've got to make sure you do containment. Uh, it, it's part of the design and, and engineering that we focus on with any of the most um, cooling solutions that we have to be able to contain it. Agree. Yeah. Uh, so it's correct, right? S a sealed server approach is usually rack-based, right? It usually includes a vertical stack rack. Well, yeah, your, your topology changes um, depending on the, the infrastructure layer you want to have, whether you're doing it horizontal or vertical. Yeah. So because we're doing it vertical, you want to have easy access to the server. You want to have quick release. You'll use blind mates to uh, valves, blind mate power. Uh, and you follow the, the same nature in which you're removing an air-cooled server today. And so you just draw it out yeah. the rack and away you go. Right. Uh, so if you look at the rear of a rack, you get you see similar items very often as with cold plate, right? Connect, interfaces, power. It, it, it's, uh, the strategy is, in some cases, also overlapping with, uh, the, the, uh, with cold plate challenges. Open bath is a fundamentally different approach. Uh, so the, op the term open, as I mentioned before, refers to the, the air interface to the liquid being open. Uh, so there's surface tension between the liquid and, uh, and air. So by definition, an open bath structure is tank 
style. Yeah? So it's got a tank, there's multiple servers in the same tank. Yeah? If you're not doing that, if you're only doing one server per tank, then you, uh, you would most likely seal it and put it in a rack. Yeah? And then you get back to being closed chassis. Um, type of cooling circuits applied are either based on CDUs or direct facility interfaces. Now, that same division also applies to enclosed chassis. Um, even though right now it's, uh, on the, it mistakenly mentions only closed secondary and dripless connectors, but uh, I've learned recently that there's also uh, facility inter uh, direct facility interfaces possible. So we'll make sure to correct that in the specifications. Uh, but there's also such a thing as hybrid. Um, they're not very common yet. Um, Fujitsu is a great example of a manufacturer, even though they're not part of OCP, just for example-wise, they use a tank style which fits inside a 19-inch rack. Yeah, so that's interesting. It's a way of dealing with technology. So some things can overlap. Now, the point of this whole specification is to create an open structure where innovation can take place. So we don't want to make any, define anything that stops anyone from developing. Yes? Can you please use the microphone? Yeah. <laughs> uh, one was on uh, uh, wet zone, dry zone, for uh, and uh, immersible optics. And then the other one was uh, heat exchangers. Right. So the question is? Oh, when, I, when I went back to your, uh, your previous slide, th there's also a uh, wet zone, dry zone for uh, optics, if you need to do uh, copper or, or uh, optics. You need, you, are you able to immerse it? Right. That's actually something that will be addressed in the IT gears pack. Yeah, so that's not part of the immersion standards or definitions, at least not yet. Maybe it will be. Uh, but right now that's addressed in the IT gear specs. When it comes to heat exchanges, that goes much further into unique solution designs, and that's something that we actively tried to avoid. Okay. Yeah, because we don't want to get into the area where we're going to uh, uh, predefine any type of heat exchanging method. That's where the industry is still too young and where uh, that's where all the new inventions are taking place. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, certification compliancy. Now, this is something that should be taken seriously. Right? Um, let me give you a little example. Um, some of you may, have, may be familiar with the Asperger systems. Um, in the early days, we had this automatic lid designed because it was cool, right? It looks cool, it looks fantastic. Eh? You go to an event, you open the lid, it opens automatically, dramatic. Um, there was no way we could ever get a CE certification with that. No way. The, on the demo system, we still have it, but with only, the only purpose of that is to keep the lid in position so that nobody can move it. Um, the reason for that is, We've got a mechanically moving part, moving by itself. And that means we have to comply with the machine directive, which is a rule, but which is a set of regulations in Europe, which states that if there's a moving part there you could potentially, no matter how unlikely, but get your fingers in between, you need to have this big red mushroom button somewhere really accessible. You can't hide it anywhere. Uh, so having that button should kill the power to the system, essentially killing the server environment, doing also, so we had to, it's, it doesn't make any sense. So these type of things actually do, uh, do have an impact on design, on solutions. Uh, that certification must be in place, otherwise you're not even allowed to trade commercially. And it goes also for the United States, that goes for Europe, and that goes for any region in the world. And sometimes there are additional rules and certifications required for, for individual countries or even provinces within a country or even a specific city. And that can be a nightmare. 
uh, but this is regular business. This also applies to servers, uh, to anything in the world, but you need to be compliant with all sorts of regulations. That's, the, that's part of the awareness that needs to take place. And these certifications, are you can just find them on the internet. There's a Wikipedia page referenced in the spec document where you can find all these certifications. Now, get to safety. Um, safety is a big thing, right? And we're not just talking about business continuity. We're not just talking about uptime. We're talking about human interaction, human safety. We are talking about liquid systems, water, dielectric liquids, chemicals. So we've got a lot of ingredients uh, for potential hazards. Now, innovation is great. We get to do some really cool stuff, and pioneering is cool, prototyping is terrific. A lot of the technologies are, are gaining in a maturity level, uh, but safety, so that means that it's the right time to really rec uh, put in some safety standards with a lot of these systems. Uh, that means anything that's electric must be shielded, especially if you get above that 48 volts. Right? Consider the fact that we're all driving towards very high density computes. Well, if you do get that rack with 200 kilowatt, that actually gets much closer to an electrical plant than a data center. So electrical safety is gonna be something to be aware of, especially because we're also connected to water circuits. Water, doesn't, water and, electric, and electricity don't really go well together, right? Uh, something like bus bar protection, something to consider. A building in a bus bar, um, it might or might not be a challenge. Uh, you see some people doing it already. Um, what happens if you drop the screwdriver in? Now, if we're talking about 100 kilowatt distributed with one bus bar, or 12 volts, <laughs> it's a lot of amperage that goes through that. Uh, that's how a welding machine works. So uh, I know for a fact that a lot of the power uh, shelves do cut off the power virtually instantly. But what, what happens? What happens? These things need to be tested. These need, things need to be thought through. Um, moving parts, I, I mentioned as an example, huh, to get your hands in between something that automatically moves and actuates or whatever. Uh, but also applies to placing a server. If somebody's guiding that server and your hand comes in between and you can't lift it up anymore, but these type of things, especially with vertical implementations, all the mechanics are 90 degrees off. It's things that, uh, that need to be thought through. Um, but it also goes towards accessibility. Everything needs to be made, you need to be able to maintain anything whether it's an electrical switch, an electrical wire, a pipe fitting. Imagine having a fitting, having a leak, a water leak on a pipe, and you can't reach it because two systems have been completely installed against each other, and so blocking the access to the pipe. And you have to dismantle half the data center just to get access to the leak. I mean, these are things that you can't have. That's part of the design, uh, that needs to be part of the design to have access to everything that might even potentially, even remotely fill. Uh, both from electrical, hydraulic, or even instruments that might be in place. Sensors are a thing. Flow sensors, temperature sensors. Anything that might be critical for the safety of the system, or for the integrity of the system, you should be able to maintain it. So one of the things that I think we probably should include in the spec is, um, well, we run into this all the time because the drawer weighs 40 pounds, right? And if it weighs more than 40 pounds, then it requires two people to service it. Um, and a drawer full of liquid's gonna weigh a lot more than a drawer that's just got air in it. Yeah, so I fully agree. 
fully agree. So the servicing method. Um, are you participating in the work stream? No, no I don't yeah. think so, right? Yeah. Are you gonna? Yeah. Great. Looking forward to that. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, ergonomics. Right? It, it, it ha it's, it's common sense. Hey, you've got a whole business around server lifts to put something in a cabinet, and here we go, making completely different style solutions. Luckily, there's a lot of incentives with cranes, and uh, we, we've got the surface trolley with the electric lift. I've seen, uh, we saw Alibaba with the crane solution. Uh, you've got some really interesting concepts out there, but it, yeah, it needs to be taken seriously. I agree. Liquid management is another thing that is completely new. A lot of data centers already have a cooling loop. Yeah, let's be frank. Water is not the challenge. We've got plumbers on every corner of every street. Well, they're always hard to get when you need one, I know, but still. Plumbing is not the challenge, as long as it's related to water. Now, if you try to give a plumber a job with putting in an oil infrastructure, you might be running into some challenges. Uh, most of you were sitting in, in the Intel uh, session just now with the cold plate. Material compatibility. Oil is a completely different type of material than water. It will react with materials that water doesn't react with. And we're all used to water. Um, that's only one thing. Uh, if you're talking about liquid management, remember I told you both hydrocarbons and fluorocarbons, it's all chemical. That means if you're starting to deploy liquids on a large scale, it's not a negative thing. It's nothing bad about it. It's not rocket science. Hey, but you've got a plant full of chemicals. And that means that you need to take that, to, to apply standards to your environment that everybody in the chemical industry is already used to. Again, it's not rocket science. It's, you can find a lot of documentation on how to deal with, a chemi with chemicals in an environment. It basically comes down to, you need to have a ventilated room. No rocket science. You need to make sure that none of the chemicals can ever leak into the sewage. All right, that's interesting. So what happens if I've got a major leak? Yeah, so what happens if uh, my, my, my raised floor collapses because I made a, a little metric mistake with, I used the wrong metrics to calculate the floor strength, right? So one of these uh, racks full of liquid has just toppled over and it's leaking liquid all over the place. Well, you need to make sure that you can manage a spill. It's common sense. Uh, in, in the chemical industry, there is this rule of thumb that no matter how many containers you have that contain a chemical, yeah, as long as it's benign, assuming some benign, benign chemicals, nothing really scary or anything, that, but you need to have the ability to clean up a spill of the largest single container. Whether you've got 10 or 1,000, it doesn't matter. The likelihood of two big containers leaking at the same time, catastrophically, it's not very big. You just need to be able to clean up the spill, the volume of one full container. Yeah, so let's say there is a big tank containing 1,000 liters of oil. And you've got 20 other tanks containing 500 liters of oil you need to be able to clean up that massive disaster spill of that thousand liters of oil. You need to have either absorbent materials for it, you need, to have a, you need to have a means to clean it up without just flowing it into the sewer. Um, that same goes for anything that might evaporate in large quantities. And you can't just let uh, fluorocarbon evaporate into the atmosphere in large quantities. I mean, the global warming potential is pretty high of these liquids. That's something that needs to be managed. Um, so containment 
is one of these features. So single hull systems, for example, uh, if you have an oil-based system and it contains a single hull, it should be placed on either a leak tray or in a room that is liquid proof. A leak tray should, should be able to capture the full capacity of the largest contain container. Um, that's a rule of thumb in the chemical industry. Uh, if you have a dual hull system, hey, it becomes a lot easier. You don't need leak trays, uh, but you still need to be able to clean up a spill. You still need to prevent, it from, prevent anything from entering the sewage. Uh, thermal protection, another one. Um, over protection, evaporation, uh, uh, over pressure, evaporation, but also uh, you need to prevent overheating of a solution. Simply put, the IT will die. If serious overheating events that are not managed properly, chips will damage, thermal interface material will be affected. Uh, so if you're boiling servers, literally, uh, or, at a, or if you if you, if you let them sit in an oil basin, an oil tub with 100 degrees Celsius oil, those servers are dead. They will not function anymore. Um, if you stop the cooling supply to a two-phase system and you let that go, you keep letting it run, eventually you're gonna, to, gonna be running into some serious trouble. And it's gonna cause uh, overpressure, it's gonna cause uh, um, exhausting into the atmosphere. So these, th these are type of things that need to be tackled or addressed in whatever way. As long as it's addressed, as long as it's documented, as long as it's defined, it's something that you can deal with, that you can prepare for, that you can be ready for. It just needs to be in place. Uh, just like the documentation, safety documentation, material safety, technical data of, the, of any chemicals, it's mandatory to have that data. If, the, if there is a disaster in some way and you need, uh, uh, an ambulance needs to come in and they, see, they need to know what kind of chemicals are there on site. It's not that they're harmful, it just needs to be there. Just like the ingredients list on, on dishwasher liquid or anything that interfaces, that you interface with or you consume. Um, and at least one person, and we kept this description still fairly generic, uh, there needs to be trained personnel for chemical spill management. Whether that's one that is always available on site or whether it's uh, a person that is trained and can be on call or standby, uh, we have not gone to that level of detail. But people in the facility needs to be able to deal with spill management, chemicals. Now here we've got some feature classifications. Now, the document that uh, is a standard uh, contains a bit even more details than this. It actually specifies the type of sen uh, the amount of sensors, uh, or what type of sensors are required. Um, minimum requirement for anything that is related to immersion is that thermal sensors are located on the input and the output of the water circuit and of the oil or, or the two-phase. Um, there has to be an overheating alert and pump status needs to be reported if there is a pump. Uh, status, am I on, am I off? Really basic. Now define thermal optimized systems which monitor the power, which can monitor the power input if it applies. Uh, the water temperature input output. Uh, so the, the standard was the, related to the dielectric liquid uh, thermal optimized related to the facility liquid. Yeah. So the water temperature, uh, that's going to be changed to facility coolant temperature, input, output. Uh, um, the facility coolant flow rate monitoring uh, and also flow rate control. So either with valves or by controlling a pump, or whichever way. So you, can monitor, so you can manage the delta over an immersion system. 
The high safety specification goes into monitoring the dielectric quality, whether it's uh, water detection or chemical detection or generic dielectric strength. Doesn't really matter. We didn't go into that level of specifying. But the quality of the dielectric must be managed uh, in some way. Volume must, must be detected. In an open bath, it's basically how high is the liquid. How do you, how do you measure the volume? How do you monitor the volume in an enclosed chassis, uh, Nigel? Or just a sensor? Is it like a pressure or also physical level? Oh, I forgot the microphone on that one. Do you want to do you want to repeat it uh, so that uh, so that's on the recording? All right. Um, well, pressure sensing is a thing that needs to happen. You need to manage it. Manage it. No, if it's uh, a two-phase system, you may want to manage the pressure inside the system on the dielectric side. Uh, but on the water side, you want to manage the pressure as well. If you're incorporating heat exchangers and they're designed, well, in, in our case, for example, uh, to a spec of eight bars for the full assembly of the whole heat exchanging setup, then you want to make sure that the system warns you when you get too close to any limits. Now, eight bars is not very common. Uh, we can even go up a, little, a bit further than that, so there's safety margins in that, but still, you want to be able to manage that. Um, data center infrastructure management, alerting. You need to be able to send out alerts uh, if something happens, if the system does detect something, somebody needs to know about it. Without that, any detection is completely and utterly useless. Yeah, okay, I've detected the failure, but there's nobody to warn, so it's going to happen. So that needs to be able to integrate with DSIM. That means you need to be able to send out warnings at different levels. Um, informational, warning, critical. Uh, you need to be able to prevent false alarms. Um, easiest way of doing that is by using multiple sensors. Uh, as far as we call it, a democratic system of sensors. Uh, so if you've got three sensors, two out of three need to confirm the problem. Yeah? If it's one sensor, you can never have a safety scenario. Yeah, so the system should never shut off a water circuit or cut off the power based on one sensor. Um, pump or power control should be in place. Uh, you need to uh, preferably re remote or automate it. Uh, and it needs to contain an auto shut off. IT is a power input. Uh, that's, some, that's a different perspective than traditional air cooling. Um, power inputs. Uh, when we're talking about immersion, power input means thermal, thermal production that's caused by power input. So if something starts overheating or you get a problem, you need to be able to, to stop that power input because that is what is, what is changing the situation. It's the primary effect in any immersion system. So that's something that needs to be able, yes. No, there's not. It's just my uh, typing work on the presentation. So there's no difference between thermal sensors and temperature sensors. They're, they both refer to the exact same thing. Yes, go on. How do you monitor or adjust for the dielectric quality? You, I'm sorry, you, uh, yeah, I wanted to take that. That's a good, great question. So how do you monitor or adjust for dielectric quality? Right, you've got sensors for that. Um, adjusting for dielectric quality is a bit less easy. Uh, um, to get dielectric, uh, to get problems with dielectric strength of the liquids, um, that's very unlikely by itself. And if that happens, it's most likely to be a sloping curve over time. But you have dielectric sensors that you can implement in any, uh, most types of liquid, it's also with oil. Um, I'm not familiar with dielectric sensors for uh, fluorocarbons. 
I don't, I wouldn't think so either, but still. Um, the mitigation to it, if, if you really get down to a level that you're uncomfortable with, you have to do a liquid swap. Right? But it, you have to do a lot of effort. You have to really try hard to get into any danger level. Yeah? Air has a dielectric, a dielectric strength of 3 kilovolts per millimeter. Um, to get down to that level with any of the dielectric liquids, I've, I've tried. I've not succeeded. And I've tried really hard. And that's trying to get it down to 3 kilovolts. And I've, the lowest I've been able to get it is to 16. That's by really polluting liquid. Yeah. Okay, can, can, would you mind taking the? Uh, I feel that that's a good question coming up. <laughs> um, does the does the quality of the dielectric uh, impact the amount of heat that you're also able to just remove? So I mean, there's one thing that this thing is is you know insulating and not creating arcs, but just you know, based off the convection heat transfer, is there a relationship between the quality of the oil and the amount of heat that it can pull off? Yeah, there might be. So you don't know? Uh, no, actually, no, it's, it's related to a very great amount, a very huge amount of variables. Viscosity, thermal capacity, heat carrying capacity, um, a numerous amount of variables and properties of the liquid may be affected by pollution. Uh, which will, al which may or may also not also have an effect on dielectric strength. So there is no direct relation between dielectric strength and thermal capabilities. Although uh, um, electrical conductivity and uh, thermal conductivity, uh, yeah, okay, that's <laughs> are related. Right. So you could argue that polluted liquid and the lower, uh, uh, lower dielectric strength might actually increase your thermal properties, but now it's a little bit more complicated than that, because if, especially if it's a degradation that you're referring to, and that may have all sorts of effects to many different properties of whatever liquids you're using. So is, are you guys currently looking at the properties of the liquid independently uh, for that, or no? Always. I think that's part of the core business of any immersion technology provider to optimize the thermodynamics, whether that's by taking mechanical measures or uh, modifying the fluid together with whatever manufacturer of the fluid, whether it's 3M or in our case Shell or whichever fluid provider or sometimes some companies do it themselves. Sorry? QVL. Right. Okay. So, <laughs> so is there a sensor that does that in real time, or is it just something periodic and design? So there's no sensor that does it. Uh, as Paratus, we, we, uh, we, we give the uh, uh, dielectric strength sensor, as an, uh, we provide it as an optional Got it. feature. Uh, so basically, in our technology, we, uh, we apply a water sensor, water detector, mm -hmm. that's simple, low cost. For about 700 bucks more, you get a dielectric strength thing. So it, if it starts conducting, then there's water, so it doubles as that function. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I've tried. I've failed to get oil down to the level where it becomes a real concern. Um, I, can't test, I can't attest to anything that might happen in the future with other types of IT components that may or may not be invented. So far, I've not seen anything that may, that will create a kind of degradation that is to worry about. So therefore, we supply that as an option. Okay, thank you. But there's others that, other technology that may, that may or may not include that. So, Redfish, data center infrastructure management. Um, in the spec document, there is a, uh, an actual sample of what that looks like in scripting language. I'm not a scripter, I'm not a programmer, so I'm probably using the wrong terms already, so please don't mind me. Um, that contains an example of 
what that would look like. Um, and that is focused on very basic reporting of statistics. It allows you to do reporting to, uh, in a container that's called immersion. Uh, and it has to be technology uh, agnostic, uh, solution agnostic. So that's, therefore we've determined some basic potential values like on off, flow, pressure, well, the list is here. Um, it also includes some alarming features uh, to allow sending out an alert and it, it, it contains some control set points. Now, is there anyone in here that is, uh, in, that is knowledgeable about Redfish or specifically wants to know more about Redfish or programming on that? Great, so let's go to the next one. <laughs> right, so this is where it gets interesting. Right, so we, we've determined, and this is something that the cold plate work stream is also adopting, and this will be adopted in the ACS group altogether. We're gonna base everything on SI. So everyone in the United States, I really do apologize to make your lives difficult. But we need to work with the same metrics, otherwise we're geared up for failure, yeah, because we don't, get, we don't understand each other anymore. Um, so these are the metrics, and these will come back in all the following slides. Yeah, so talking about degrees, by the way, degrees Celsius and Kelvin are the same quantity, they just have a different zero point. Yeah. Um, so first of all, when it comes to specifying a technology, uh, covered the actual description or the, the, the meaning of it earlier on. Any technology should be able to be described with what type of rack? Rack based, tank based. Great, that gives you a great indication of what a technology looks like. Solution type, single phase, two phase. It's not complicated yet because this is what we're all familiar with already. But now it's formal, now it's official. Um, Liquid category, uh, that's where we're getting into a more a newly defined domain. So we've determined it has to be clear that you're working with either hydrocarbon or fluorocarbon. To this point, we are, com we, are, we are not aware of any other type of chemical substance or natural liquid that could do this job of immersion. If somebody does have an idea, Please feed it into the work stream because I'd love to know about it. And I, I guarantee you I'm not the only one. Um, the liquid type, and this is also a relevance, whether it's a commodity liquid or a proprietary liquid. Uh, fluorocarbons are very often proprietary liquids and also have their, have their pros and cons on that respect. Same goes for commodity liquid, they have their pros and their cons. Uh, oil, for example, usually commodity style. You've got engineered oils, uh, highly engineered oils as well, which are going for really high values of money. Uh, I'm not going into the actual value discussion here. I really want to avoid that because that's a can of worms. Um, but that needs to be part of a solution description. Uh, compliancy. Uh, levels, uh, so whether you're thermally optimized, obviously everybody needs to be standard. Uh, so the standard is the minimum requirement for any liquid, to, for any immersion technology. Thermal optimized is a classification, high safety is a classification. And uh, uh, last week another classification suggestion came in from WeWin to define service. Great, serviceability, which is terrific. Any more classifications that might come up in the future, they will be added to the list. So this, can, this is gonna be a living list anyway. Now, we're getting into the densities. And this is where it gets really interesting, I think, at least. Now, there's a lot of claims out there on densities. Also, potential densities. Now, a lot of these density claims are very difficult to interpret. I've got a 300 kilowatt rack open tank, open bath, immersion. 
I, I, but I don't, by the way, for the record. But it's a claim. I can think of a three meter long tank that can do, uh, which is four, two meters wide, that can do 300 kilowatt, kilowatt without any exceptional technology. But it's hard to interpret. Um, I've got an asparagus solution. I can conceive that I might be able to do 100 kilowatts in it because I've got thermal models that prove it. Also not relevant. What have I actually deployed? What have I proven that is actually capable? What have, uh, what's the status of my development? So you get, some of you may have seen the WeWin presentation. Uh, the thermal capabilities of that solution is actually higher than the numbers that they presented. Why is that? Uh, well, that's the deployment they've got. That's the deployment they've done. Um, and what is important to understand is that even if you look at density figures across platforms, these density figures are still variables. It doesn't mean that you can just go ahead and select any type of IT assembly and say, okay, I just assembled three kilowatts of IT. That, specific, uh, that supplier says they can manage three kilowatts in a one-use chassis, and I can just toss it together and it will work for three kilowatts. No, it actually requires some balancing, some engineering, often some optimization. So you can just go ahead and assume that, any, that, that, that claim will apply to everything. Yeah? Because it's, uh, it's dependent on flow, the IT design, the type of liquids used, maybe uh, the, 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 t the amount of services there are. Uh, a, a heat rejection of one kilowatt divided over 10 chips that are equally performing, 100 watts, is a completely different thermodynamic challenge than one tiny chip that does a kilowatt. It's a completely different story. So, well, how, do, how do we look at these density figures now? We're divided, we made a division between compute density, solution density, and solution footprints. Complicated uh, looking slide, but let me, let me elaborate on this. Um, and every density have to be has to be related to a temperature. So, let's get back to that 300 kilowatt example. I've got a 300 kilowatt tank. It's whatever size. It makes a difference if I need minus 10 degrees Celsius helium to cool that thing, or whether, it, whether I can do that with 40 degrees Celsius. That makes a lot of difference. Right? So it relates to a temperature. Let's start with that. Now, I've got a rack, and when I stall it, it contains that footprint. Let's say it's one meter by one meter long, that's one square meter. And in that footprint, I can do 20 kilowatts. I can do 20 kilowatts in, uh, that's my compute density all of a sudden. But I've got a water interface, I've got an electrical cabinet, I need, uh, so I've got some valves there, and those take up space as well. So that is maybe a cover plate in front, or maybe it's just the door of a rack, the rear door and the front door. That might actually take up some additional space in addition to the physical footprint where it's actually standing on. Now, that's what we call solution, for, uh, the solution density. The full density, the kilowatt hours, uh, the kilowatts that you can dissipate or that you're actually dissipating related to that service area. What is, the, does, is that valuable for your white space design? No, it's not. Because it makes a difference if you need to have, uh, if you're going to implement a rack that you can access from two ends, front or back, or whether you have a solution that you only need to service from one end. Do I have to be able to walk all the way around it, or do I just have that single side interface? And how much space do I need to walk there or to service a server? In the context of a room that I equip in the most efficient manner, completely with my solution. So if I need a CDU, uh, I don't have to calculate this for one tank if my CDU is designed for four tanks. 
Uh, I can calculate, okay, what does the room look like with four tanks, including the CDU, how much extra space do I need? If I have five of those installations together or a dozen, whatever fits you, suits your needs. And then you calculate the floor space and then look at the kilowatts per square meter. So that's a decline. Yeah? So compute density is the highest figure. Solution density is less. Solution footprint is always the least because that's what you can use for white space, for getting an indication of your white space density. Now, if I'm doing this with 12 degrees Celsius and somebody else is doing that with 50 degrees Celsius cooling, then you still cannot compare. Therefore, we've decided any, any solution provider has to provide the figure that is related to the ASHRAE W3 standard, which is 32 degrees Celsius, and it has to relate to the solution footprint, which is the least economical, because that gives you an indication of how much floor space you're actually sacrificing for that amount of kilowatt. Is that all understandable? Yeah? Cool. Now here's the next set of questions that people have to be able to ask to any kind of solution provider, and that solution provider should be able to provide these answers. <coughs> Kilowatts per cubic meter of fluorocarbon. Now, that is a figure that is not relevant for hydrocarbons. Do I need to explain that to anyone? Yeah? All right. Hydrocarbons are usually low-cost liquids. So the liquid volume that you need is not necessarily relevant per kilowatt. Whereas a fluorocarbon that is usually very high cost uh, and usually used for very high-powered systems, high-efficiency systems, uh, become a cost effect. So it's a common strategy to minimize the, the amount of liquid that you use with fluorocarbons to achieve the highest efficiency. Am I explain, uh, am I explain that correctly, Nigel? And, uh, yeah, uh, okay, cool. Okay. So, so with hydrocarbons, that value of the liquid is much less of a concern. So it's very simple. Uh, so to give you an example, the uh, uh, hydrocarbons that Asperitas uses, the cost of that one and a half euro per liter. That's two dollars per liter. That's a, for a full tank swap, that's 700 bucks. That's it. It's not a, a cost element. So a few liters more, or even 50 liters more, just to add to the efficiency and the thermodynamic properties, that's not a concern. With fluorocarbons, that's a completely different story. So I'm not going into the price levels of fluorocarbons because that's, that, that's a whole different range of different values, but that's where the relevance is. Um, for facility design, that's also one of the very common questions. So because you're using liquids, it must be very heavy. So, which is true, right? Although if you compare it to a fully loaded OCP rack, it's actually not that different sometimes. Uh, um, mind you, oil, uh, especially oil, has a lower density than water. It floats on water. Whereas fluorocarbons are a lot heavier, with much greater density. Correct, right? What's the average density of fluorocarbon? Great. In the range of? All right, cool enough. No worries. Yeah. No worries. Uh, but it's, 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 it's always more than uh, higher than water. So, so uh, 100 liters of fluorocarbons is much heavier than water is, and whereas uh, 100 liters of oil is a lot less. So on the total solution, it does matter, although with fluorocarbons, you use less commonly. Uh, IT becomes a factor on that. So that's why we uh, determined that there has to be some different figures in there. So, and there is a relevance to that. So first of all, static load is defined by kilonewtons per square meter. It's used in construction. Sorry, can't help it. It's what 
construction engineers are used to work with, eh? not with kilograms, but kilonewtons. Now, there's a difference between bad solution, full solution, and IT solution, and that's relevant. If you need, if you got a bare solution, so something that you buy, it's being delivered to you. Yeah, if you buy an immersion system, open bath, you get the tank. It doesn't contain liquid yet, it doesn't contain a tea yet. But you need to move it to that location inside the data center. And it's still a pretty heavy device. It's not like a bunch of servers or an empty rack that's only maximum 100 kilos. So it might be a very big rack that is very heavy, and you need to make sure that the whole route towards that white space can take that load. Very basic little thing that you just need to be aware of. Um, the full solution includes the liquid. So you commission it, you put it in place, it contains the liquid, and that's the baseline weight. And then comes the variable, which is IT. One server, can be five kilograms, another server can be 50. And so the IT solution describes the potential full weight of the solution filled with liquid and IT. But it is a variable, but it's something that you need to design for in construction based on, ki on kilonewtons per square meter. Is that understandable? I guess so. All right, cool. Height clearance. <laughs> nice one. Um, millimeters to ceiling. So the advantage with, uh, a great advantage with liquid cooling is that you can actually reduce ceiling height most, in most situations because you don't need the airflow, right? Um, so it's really interesting to look at the actual height limits of different solutions. With open bath, it's usually determined by the distance that you need to clear a server for extraction. Uh, as opposed to what some people tend to think, the lid opening, that that being the maximum, no. It's actually the clearance that you need for the IT to be extracted. That's the most common height requirement. Uh, with the rack-based solution, it's simply the height of the rack. Is it, yeah? That's an interesting one. So this is actually not a specification of maximum height. This is a specification that requires you to supply the information. Yeah, so if I want to sell my technology to you, you can ask me, okay, what's the height clearance I need? And that has to be clearly documented in combination with the other metrics as well. So you should be able to get one sheet that outlines all these specs because that will answer all the questions you might have about construction or planning your facility. Uh, the transportation of that system should be my problem, not yours. If I want to supply you my kits, it's my problem to solve how to get it to you, right? But I hear you. <laughs> um, all right, temperature delta. This goes into the cooling layouts, the water, uh, the water infrastructure, or the coolant, facility coolant infrastructure. Yeah, cool. Uh, what's the delta T? A cooling infrastructure is usually laid out for a certain delta to maximize the efficiency of either chillers, dry coolers, whatever strategy is applied, adiabatic, doesn't really matter, or even reuse. But still, to increase, to maximize that efficiency, you might want to know what is the, especially with thermal optimized systems, right? You want to know what delta can be maintained automatically. But what is the tolerance? Yeah, so can you tolerate a delta that is lower than four degrees Celsius? Now, in our case, no, because then the flow rates get so low, we can't, we can't manage the safety system anymore. So, we'll, so that means we, uh, uh, so high, you know, sorry, uh, they're so high that with the maximum load, so the lowest, temp lowest temperature delta allow, uh, requires very high speed, high flow rates, uh, especially with a higher, energy tolerances, those heat exchangers are going to wear internally. Uh, beyond 14 degrees Celsius, the flow rate gets so low that we can't, me can't measure the flow anymore, especially with the lower energy input environment. Okay. 
is an example of, of how that becomes relevant. Uh, highest cooling supply tolerance. That's a bit of a vague one. Um, we've, deployed, we've deployed units where we could tolerate six, uh, 55 degrees Celsius. We're expecting that those same uh, systems will be able to, do, to work with 60 degrees Celsius cooling even. But it doesn't mean anything for uh, a much higher density application because that thermal tolerance will actually decrease if you increase the electrical input. Yeah, that, that's, that's one of the strategies of manipulating the delta. Yeah, but in this case, uh, what you, the delta can be relevant for heat rejection for the dielectric liquid. So sometimes the dielectric liquid, uh, let's say in our case, uh, if we look at the common design specs for, uh, for the asparagus technology, for example, um, our heat exchanges work most optimal with a delta of 10 degrees Celsius. That's what they're designed for. Then they have the maximum, uh, the best optimal efficiency, both on delta for the facility. Lower delta will always work, uh, but then at some point it will require higher flow rates. Um, but a higher delta, is, and we manipulate the delta with valves aut automatically because we're thermally optimized. So we apply valves. So, uh, Assuming a shared water infrastructure across multiple systems, we can manipulate the flow rate with valves on our system. So maybe I need to know what you mean by delta. So delta is the difference in temperature between yes. the input and the output? Yes. Isn't that a function of how much power you're putting into the liquid? Not necessarily. It's a function of, of both flow rate yeah. and power input and efficiency of the heat exchanger, of course. But, uh, so, but it's a combination of both. Um, it's about the tolerance of, uh, so immersion technology usually includes uh, uh, a certain thermodynamic uh, design with, in a dielectric substance. Uh, please take the microphone there. So it's a function of junction temperature, inlet temperature of the fluid, and the flow rate. So basically, you need to have the relationship of the flow rate with different junction temperatures and the inlet temperature of the oil. So if you want to, I would say, reduce delta, at the, you'll have to increase the flow rate or lower the inlet temperature. And so there is no free lunch. You'll have to pay for the pump. And that is just specific to single phase. When you do two phase, your delta is like one to two degree because it's stick to the boiling temperature of the fluid. And you just need to cool the fluid, the vapor, down the boiling point. That's it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And sorry, just one thing, one more thing to add. Most of the times, all the fluids I would say <coughs> are the function so the properties of the fluid is a function of temperature. So with different temperatures, your conductivity will change, your density will change, your viscosity will change, especially in oil. You, you'll see the huge difference if you have 30 degree, 40 degree, 50 degree, 60 degree temperature, different temperatures, and if you compare the kinematic viscosity, so you'll see the huge difference. So that will also affect to the pumping power. So if you have high temperature and low viscosity, yes, you're good, right, you know? You are, you are paying less for the pumping power. But on the other case, your viscosity is increasing. Sorry, density is increasing. Yeah. So it's all about a figure of merit. And don't, don't OK, uh, uh, let's, let's say you've got a dry cooler strategy. Right? Uh, increasing the temperature on the water circuit, uh, incre sorry, increasing the delta on the water circuit will greatly enhance the efficiency of the dry cooler. Simply because you're working with lower flow rates, higher deltas, Compared to the out, especially compared to the outside temperature which you're relying on, which makes your heat exchanging a lot more effective and efficient. So capitalizing on higher deltas will actually give you a lot of benefit towards your total facility efficiency.
Um, last one on the comparison metrics. Um, some of the information that is also relevant for comparison. Um, Non-IT power per kilowatt. If you require pumps to displace the liquids, don't forget these pumps consume power. You need to be aware of that in the total efficiency calculations. Yeah? That power of a pump is easiest to relate that to a power per kilowatt of IT. Yeah? Um, there's also such a thing as non-IT power overhead. It's usually quite low. Talking about management systems, monitoring. Uh, with the Asperitas technology, that's 80 watts. Um, with the WeWin solution, that is 100 watts, I believe, from the top of my head. I might be mistaken, but it, it, it's on the, it's, it was on that presentation. So these are neg negligible numbers, but they are numbers to factor in because they do add to the thermal rejection to the room, just like thermal loss to air. Right? You, let's say you've got a single hole system and you want to run it at a high temperature. That single hole is going to be a big radiator in the room. That room is going to heat up and you're going to need to cool it down. If you have a lid that doesn't seal properly or that doesn't close properly, because you have a single phase solution, you're not worried about evaporation, you just have a lid to prevent access, that lid might be leaking heat, it might be leaking hot air. Surface temperature is the hottest temperature there is in immersion cooling, except with vapor. Uh, the vapor will be the hottest, of course. Um, but that will reject into the room. So that thermal loss to air becomes a relevant figure because that will determine your air cooling strategy that you need to apply on top of the liquid strategy. Yes. Sorry, uh, uh, your question, uh, I'll, I'll repeat the question. The question is, how do you measure that? A very good question. That is the problem of the solution provider. Uh, there are different strategies. Most solution providers work together with universities or independent research institutes. They will have the capability of that. That usually involves a sealed room. You can also monitor it. You can measure it with, uh, with energy, uh, electrical input versus thermal outputs, although that will give you a lot, of, a lot more variation, variables to work with. Um, Long-term measurements, actual deployments, will also be great sources of information to come up with that figure. So yes, it is a very good question. Because especially entry uh, new technologies that might be developing may not have that data on day one. But it should be able to come up with a good estimate. If they can't, then this is that they are uh, uh, missing some information, most likely. Yeah. So you can usually measure that because it's generally possible to measure how much heat you're putting into the liquid, the outflow liquid. I mean, we're, that's why I was a little confused about the delta thing, because if you know the temperature delta between what your input and what your output is, and you know the flow rate, you can calculate how, much, how many kilowatts are going out through the liquid, and everything else is going into the air. So if you know how much power went in, and you know how much liquid heat went out, then you know everything else goes into the air. I mean, in my case, it was, it's easy because I have some stuff that's completely liquid-cooled and some stuff that's completely air-cooled. And so it's like, well, I just measure the power on this stuff, and that's all going into the air. And I didn't, I sort of ignored the fact that the pipes might get warm and put heat in the air, too. But so I, I guess that's a good reason to have And that's exactly the point. So, so in my experience with, with that type of measurement, you're going to have to factor in the power factor. Uh, and, and you have to look at the curves of the power that goes in and comes out, because that actually affects the, uh, the, the actual wattage that is being <laughs> converted into heat. And these things never really add up, in my experience. If you're just using the power inputs and the thermal output calculation. Also, the tolerances of the thermal sensors. Yeah. Uh, well, no. If I'm losing, with my system, we actually have a thermal loss of around 2%. 
Right? So if I got a 20 kilowatt installation, the thermal loss, if that would go up to half a kilowatt, you would eventually need a chiller, especially if you got 50 of those units in a room. I guess I, I don't know that's all. My, my, no, But you already have an air circulation environment. Yeah. If you're deploying in a liquid design environment where you, where you actually don't want to have that air, right. air circulation. I, I suspect so. uh, but that's where it becomes relevant. Uh, so for example, uh, we've done a, a large deployment uh, in Holland, and that room contains zero ventilation, which is not, a, not according to our recommendation. But the operator wanted it that way because he was curious. So what we've noticed that uh, is that throughout the year, it, we had a heat wave last summer, a long one. And even during that heat wave, the temperature inside the room remained relatively equal to the outside temperature. It didn't really raise, even though there was zero ventilation. Why is that? Because our systems are completely thermally insulated, double, uh, double hulled thermal insulation in between, dual, even the, is uh, the lid is doubled, right? But until you open it, <laughs> so until you open one for servicing, you can't spend more than three minutes in that room because you'll be sweating all over it. The heat that comes off that, especially at the temperatures with free cooling, especially with free cooling and outside temperatures being 40 degrees. I mean, that's, that's going to be hot when they open that lid. And so that thermal leakage is a relevant figure if you're, trying, if you're designing a... Uh, your thermal layout or your hydraulic layout for a purposely designed liquid environment. All right, chassis size and type and brand compatibility, this goes into the IT spectrum. Um, these differ per, sol per solution, per type of solution. Chassis size, uh, we win, presented these seven inch or seven and a half inch wide Asperges we use 15 inch, 19 inch, 21 inch. Uh, ICW uses 21 inch. Uh, uh, there are several different measures out there. Um, and this is something that seems to be evolving now, especially with the OCP designs, with the thickness. Um, so it's relevant to document what type of chassis is used because it may or may not become more or less relevant towards the future, we just simply don't know. This is part of an evolution that we see happening around us right now. Uh, chassis type is relevant, is it an enclosed chassis approach? Is it an immersion optimized system? Yeah, so is it really optimized and designed for liquid? I mean, that can be an advantage. It can also be something that's in the way if you just want to be reverse compatible. Depends on your strategy. So, so an air design might be very useful for some, whereas optimization of IT will allow you to achieve certain goals. And brand compatibility um, is just a relevant piece of information. I won't get into that. Now, um, I've shown this already today, right? Um, has, anyone, has any one of you actually thought about that three kilovolts per millimeter story? Did that? Did that do anything with anyone? Just stay be, stick. Because I really would like to know. Because honestly, I do not know what it should be. All I know is that the standards that we so far have applied are based on something that doesn't apply. Right? So scientifically speaking, three kilovolts per millimeter should be an absolute minimum because it equals air. And even in air environments, sometimes you get beyond, uh, below that due to moisture or other features in the air. Um, but the three kilovolts per millimeter is actually uh, something that systems are tested against. And it's part of any kind of electrical design strategy because we design things for air. Um, on the other hand, imagine what you can do if we design it for not three kilovolts from, from an electronics point of view, we we'll start designing towards a higher specification. Yeah, we can change this as a standard. I put, we purposely put this standard in to be a little bit provocative, but, uh, but we believe it will uphold. Um, any questions on these minimum requirements? Can you um, use the mic? Yeah. 
I, I know when I spoke to you about the dielectric strength, it, it, it wasn't really dielectric strength related. It was actually related to how long you could run the fluid. When is it a good time to replace the fluid? And, and, I, and what we ended up with was that it's not a relevant factor for determining the life of the fluid. Exactly. Uh, so uh, if, if you read carefully, it uh, it's also states dielectric strength over lifetime. So you could conceive uh, an immersion environment that lasts for 20 years, uh, starts out with 50 kilovolts per millimeter and ends up at three and a half kilovolts per millimeter, which is qualified, it's done its job. So yeah, no, but that's, that's indeed the point. So I've seen a lot of requirements uh, from uh, uh, organizations that wanted to start evaluating immersion, and they just put it out there. Ah, it needs to be a dielectric strength of 50 kilovolts per millimeter, or 35, or 40, or 45. And when you ask the question, what is that based on? Well, yeah, yeah we heard it somewhere, so it feels kind of good to have that in place, because nobody knows. Okay. Are there any other questions around these minimum requirements? No? Right, cool. Um, so we're nearing the end, so don't worry, guys. Um, um, this is one of the last things that the document contains. And this is actually part of, uh, part of this will actually transfer into a harmonization document between, across the work streams. But since it doesn't exist yet, it's taken into this document for now. Um, we're talking about input and output differentiation. Um, every interface has to be marked clearly as input or output. You can't imagine how easy it is to have two identical interfaces and just use, it, use them the wrong way around. We're talking about a, a still young industry here. And it very often happens, yeah, there you go, it <laughs> happened to you as well. This is something that you don't want to be looking at at large deployments where with, with equipment that, that contains millions and millions of dollars of kit, right? <laughs> oh, well below, yeah, exactly. Uh, so another thing that, uh, and this goes also into the assumptions that you can make as a solution developer or provider, um, you must be able to assume that facility site water quality management is taken care of. It should not be a part of a solution, at least not unless you need high requirements that what is defined in the still to be defined, to be defined harmonization spec. Right, so there will be a specification for water, for water, uh, for uh, infra for uh, facility coolant quality management, and that will be the that will be uh, the level up to which no additional measures need to be implemented in any vendor solution. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, 800 kPa, uh, at least smaller than. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the upper side limit for pressure. Uh, glycol users, I got a question on that the other day. Um, we put an upper limit on glycol for 50%. Um, I got the question, why not 55%? Uh, this comes from some of the experience that I've had myself with developing immersion technology. A lot of valves, of some valves, controllable valves, that actually function and function properly have an upper limit of 50% glycol. Beyond that, they may risk getting stuck or sensors may stop giving reliable readings. And so it's based on experience that some of the intricate uh, features that you want to be able to build into immersion solutions may actually be affected with glycol percentages beyond 50%. I, I don't know 
Yeah. Very good point. Uh, I don't know how you, I mean, it's more of a chemical than material compatibility thing. Yes. With, but, I mean, for our problem, it's an insurance system. But, you could, you could, I could imagine a site that used broken white coal for like a non profit. Yeah. Which is what we would do, but. Yeah. Um, I completely so, relate what you're talking about. Yes, uh, and I agree, um, and I'm actually familiar with what you're describing. Uh, sorry, yeah, you've got oh, the microphone. So oh, yeah. sorry. Uh. Yeah, you're, you were referencing to reactions with certain uh, with with um, uh, uh, with with glycol mixtures with glycol types that will be incompatible with certain materials. Uh, in your case, alum aluminum, right? right? Uh, and yes, I am familiar with that. So, uh, and I have experience with that as well. <laughs> uh, and uh, one of my things is, well, you learn from your mistakes. That's why I know so much. So. <laughs> uh, exactly. So I, tr I try to make all my mistakes in a lab environment, and not so much in. Uh, so, uh, yes, I'm familiar with that. Um, we have not defined the spec to that level. And I think it's mostly because we simply haven't figured out how yet. So if you do see your way, the next, the next refresh of this spec will be, maybe, uh, uh, maybe use the microphone, yeah? Oh, so yeah. So other than just maybe specifying that if you have any material compatibility issues with standard coolants, that it be part of your documentation. Right. I mean, uh, if I'm going to build my part with aluminum parts, I'm going to tell people they can't use propylene glycol, you know. Yeah. No, that's a, a very fair point. Uh, although what we're trying to do is apply standards so that everybody can, so that you, so that the facilities can be laid out in, in such a way that every technology that wants to have access to that facility will just have to comply with that. So that the facility doesn't have to make changes. So this is actually a standardization document for vendors to be compliant. So uh, that specification or that remark, uh, or maybe we define the standard that both allows aluminum and all the other materials, uh, that's up to us as community. So uh, make sure to take that with you when you're uh, joining the work stream. Uh, on the uh, liquid, on the glycol, one of the things that uh, liquid cooling uses is uh, uh, you have to add, the, I, th I think it's uh, necessary to add the pH level on the glycol because it's, it's like 7 to 9. The, you, for the glycol, you have to run it basic. As soon as it gets acidic, you, get, you, have, to re you have to flush it. All right, please do, cons do mention that in the workstream call so we can give it a place. Yeah. That's great, great input, thanks. Um, and finally, we've determined uh, galvanic properties. Uh, anyone familiar with galvanic corrosion? You've worked with aluminum? Have you ever tried to attach aluminum, aluminum to stainless steel? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've done that. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a sailor, so I'm, uh, I'm intimately familiar with the combination. So, uh, Galvanic corrosion is a real thing. It's real, and it can actually cause some serious trouble. Um, in the document, there is a description around it. Uh, it's currently stated it should be 0.15 volts versus whatever facility interface is going to be applied. That will be dependent on the uh, harmonization layer. Several ways to work around it. Either just don't use metallic interface materials, so you're always free to do what you want. Uh, you may, if you use aluminum and stainless or other mixtures of materials inside the solutions, um, make sure to start considering anodes 
uh, that might need servicing. Uh, there are different strategies, different ways of dealing with that. But it's something to be aware of because we're working with water. We're working with water-based infrastructures. We're working with liquids. And we're working with equipment that is protecting much more valuable equipment. Yeah, so the IT is what is um, happening. So that pretty much covers the entire, uh, most of the spectrum. Um, there's some stuff that I didn't cover when it comes to real do to the documentation level that is uh, that we've documented and required additional liquid specifications that should that must be available. Uh, that's all in the document. Um, this is the upcoming workload for the immersion activities, so make sure to join. Um, the submitted spec, this presentation will be available online on the OCP Summit page as a result of the, uh, on this presentation, I will upload it tonight. Uh, that link is a link to the document, so yeah, if you're going to type it over, it's going to be a bit of a mess, but the links are also on the wiki page, on the ACS wiki page. Uh, we got a separate, uh, it's not editable anymore. It's read-only for anyone who wants to try and edit. It's read-only if you want to suggest changes. Uh, second line is the change suggestion document. Uh, so if you've got updates, the next refresh of the document will be in six months from now. And we'll be updating the specs every six months or so. All right, that's it. Um, I hope this was interesting for you all. That's, uh, thanks for uh, the interaction and the feedback. We'll, uh